All right, hello world. Welcome back to Golf Subpar. Colt Nost, Drew Stoltz. Sleaze, what a week it was at the American Express Championship for Hudson Swafford. By the way, future guest of Golf Subpar. 100%. Just picked up his third PGA Tour win. I think it's the year of the dogs, bud. You think? Oh, what gives you that indication? God almighty. I mean, shit going pretty good for the boys down there in Georgia. Just take the whole state and lump them into it, too, because Braves won the World Series. Hawks will probably find a way to win the NBA championship, probably scoop a few in free agency. Everything's going right. Hudson Swaffer wins. Russell Henley damn near did it in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Stafford do it looking pretty good down in L.A. in the conference championship game. I mean, yeah, the, the dogs – are Dogs are barking. They're barking right now. They are barking, no doubt about it. But, man, what a final round. 64, capped off a little eagle on 16, 20-footer for birdie on 17, and then a clutch 8-footer for par to get the job done. 23 under, like I said, his second win there at PGA West. Something about that place. He loves it. He goes out early in the winter, rents a place at the hideaway, which I know you're very familiar with. And, man, Palm Springs is a second home for him. Yeah, dude. I think that going down there early, just getting camped out when you're – East Coast guy, that going. if you're going to play Hawaii, it's like go to Georgia, to Hawaii, then back. Like, it's just a lot of travel. They, a handful of those Georgia guys, or at least the island guys, go out there and camp in Palm Springs, kind of set up shop, stay out there for the holidays, makes Hawaii super easy. It's just a little trip. Then they come back and do it over there, and whatever it is, he's got it figured out. But, man, it got interesting for a while there. After that bogey, he kind of he took the lead by two after 14 with the birdie. Then he comes back, bogey's 15. At that point, when he walked off the green, headed to the 16 tee, seven guys. Within one shot of him. And the 16 coming down as, as short as it was playing yesterday, that's a very eagleable hole. There have been a number of them beforehand. And damned if he didn't step up and just go, I mean, driver seven iron into that hole. That's different. Ooh, I mean, that's seven that is 200. moving it. And that shot was just painting the flag the entire way. Makes that makes that beagle and then goes to 17. Little tuggy, maybe perhaps off the tee, aiming left of that flag. Probably not what he's looking for, but he gets it up there, rolls that in, and from then. Makes 18 a little bit easier. But even that little, like, what, what do you have, eight feet coming back on 72nd after oh, yeah. he ran it by? Hoagie's sitting out there in the fairway with, like, a wedge or something like that. He had to think at that point, like, this is the one to win it. Because yeah. Hoagie could easily knock a wedge in there and make birdie, and all of a sudden you're in a playoff. No doubt about it. And, by the way, i got to give a little shout-out real quick if you're watching on YouTube to our hoodies we're rocking. Yes. You got Sleazy Bird. I got Gravy Bird. The whole flock God. is here. Make what sure else you, do you need? Make sure you go to that Golf.com Pro Shop and pick you out some. These things are Incredible. The boys are a little hungover from the weekend. You know, they had a time. I'm, I'll be honest. I'm not I'm not hungover personally. I just got off the plane from the DR, Dominican Republic. I was down there covering the Latin American amateur. By the way, Dominican Republic is sneaky a lot further away than you think it is. And uh, But what a week it was. I was down there. Aaron Jarvis, freshman, UNLV, gets the job done, shoots seven under par, books his ticket to the Masters and the Open Championship at St. Andrews. He's from the Cayman Islands. No one from the Cayman Islands has ever played in the Masters or the Open Championship. What is it, two golf courses? I believe there's two golf courses. Two golf facilities in all of the Cayman yeah. Islands. I think one is nine holes. Is that correct? That's one's a, nine, one's 18. We're not big fat guys, so we'll just yeah, say, we'll that's just say that. Is. There's not a lot of golf yeah. in the Cayman Islands, and now Aaron Jarvis putting him on the map. I mean, 19 years old, freshman. Hey, uh, we got any tournaments first week of April? If so, won't be in the lineup. Going to be yeah. playing a little deal called the Masters. I mean, what a... Hell of a deal down there. That'd be fun, though. I mean, those tournaments are sweet. Do you throw a freaking uh, master's invite on the lines at an amateur tournament? You're going to see some gagging down the stretch, and you got we it, did. didn't you? Yeah. There was. There was. Um, De La Fuente, my man from Mexico. De La Fuente. Three putted from 30 feet for par on the last to miss a playoff by shot. Missed a little two and a half footer sleeves. And this is what I, t I tell, you know, when we're playing at home with our buddies here, you know, a lot of guys are scooping putts and all this, waiting on you to say that's good. Listen. I, this is, I'm a big proponent of having to put everything out, and that was a perfect example. I mean, this is one 95% of the guys you play with would have knocked this back to you. But obviously, playing at home at Whisper Rock for some cash is a little different than a master's invite. But you see some weird stuff. I saw one of the craziest shots I've ever seen. Kid from Argentina, Marzilio, going for the green and two on 18, par five, had a five iron in, flags it, but it's coming up a little short, lands on a sprinkler head, which is, my God, this is about to be a disaster. Game over. Goes nine miles in the air, drops down, spins somehow still, seven feet for Eagle, ends up lipping it out to get into a playoff. That's how good these kids are these days, dude. They can land and it on sprinkler heads, heads and yeah. still spin it back. <laughs> I mean, what, what's going on? The dude's heart had to sink when it uh. landed on the – it probably looked good in the air, and then it lands and it's in the air for 17 seconds, it felt like, and then somehow give himself a good look for Eagle. Eag piece to get into a playoff but yeah you see some especially am dude you see pros gagging down the stretch all the time you get amers in there and like it's it's either augusta you get all this or you get nothing you just get a runner-up finish put it on your resume doesn't matter doesn't get you anything uh different but 
yeah, we'll see. We'll yeah. see the young man, Mr. Jarvis, down there at Augusta. But it was a it was a lot of fun down there. I got to meet the legend. If you ever watch ESPN Deportes, which I do, the legend John Sutcliffe, who is kind of like their on field reporter, the guy who made famous Monday Night. Yes, I know yes. him well. He's got a high energy, dude. He very high energy. Love him. Got to spend some time with him. Have a couple tequilas with him. What a dude! It was a it was a cool trip, man. What what the USGA, the RNA, and Augusta National is doing for amateur golf is phenomenal i love i'm here for it yeah it's cool seeing these guys get to tee it up and like they got kata nakajima now the world number one who damn near looks like a pro just played it out in hawaii out there we're gonna see him over there in augusta as well so i mean you put these things up man so it used to just be the u.s amateur now there's a handful of them out there doing it and speaking of playing for fun but with a lot of nerves online i had a big weekend this week dude we had a hate match a bunch of former subpar guests in the house this past weekend while uh while you were out of town we played teed it up on friday myself keith mitchell was in the house Joel Damon in the house, Steven Yeager in the house, Ricky Barnes, Bryce Mulder, uh, all those guys other than Yeager have been on. We'll get Yeager on uh, coming up, too. But we had a five-on-five five hate match. Team Sleaze, Mitchell, Kittleson. We went down I'm to Damon, Yeager. I'm starting to learn Yeager. that it takes current tour players to get you out to the golf course. Uh, this had been set up a little bit in advance. You're but starting yeah. to turn into Ben Hayes a little bit. Uh, yeah, it does. I Picks. There needs to be no pickleball, you know, that's an alternative, I guess, option out there. But, uh, I mean, that was, dude, we had 10 dudes out there we had a great game three count three best balls all birdies count we got clip we got mm, clip sad face keith hitting it nice though if you're looking for a little play at tory pines hitting it nice we got him on some claws on the back nine started to loose it up finish it up with a little eag piece on 18 which was Ooh. nice for the squad yeah all right well i like that well i'm sure there was a lot of callaway drivers in that group especially the new callaway rogue st driver these new drivers are the company's fastest most stable drivers ever with industry-leading innovations that create a breakthrough in performance. I'm actually heading out there next week, Sleaze, to get all dialed in. I'm going to be smashing it when I get home. I yeah, can't Yeah, get wait. that thing illegal-fied if they can. Exactly. Shave face down. They got an all-new tungsten speed cartridge that specific, has specific weight up to 26 grams, low and deep in the head for increased speed, stability, and high MOI. The construction, shaping, and positioning of their jailbreak speed frame promotes even more speed and stability. It has the industry leader in artificial intelligence. They have lowered spin and increased forgiveness in their face optimization formula. Rogue was the most played at the Century Tournament of Champions this year. To find out more, be sure to visit CallawayGolf.com slash Rogue Drivers. They got four models. And Sleaze, I heard you were hitting in the desert a little bit, so I maybe was, it's time dude. for you to make I the was. switch That's very to Callaway. Unlike me. I we, need got, it. we got four different drivers for you to choose from. We got the Rogue ST Max, Callaway's best combination of distance and forgiveness. Fits the majority of players. Got the Rogue ST Max D, dedicated draw model for players who need the most shape correction. The Rogue ST Max LS, stronger trajectory, lower spin, and more neutral ball flight. That's kind of where I'm thinking the sleeves should lean. Mm. And then we'll also we got the Rogue ST Triple Diamond LS, a compact low spin head for better players. Once again, visit CallawayGolf.com slash Rogue Drivers to learn more and figure out which Callaway driver is best for you. All right, please. Do we? I mean, our guests this year is in 2022. Well, let's just go over them. We got Kevin Kisner. Okay. Check. We got John McGinnis. Check. And now we have Rich Beam. We're bringing the personalities in 2022. We're finding dudes that are for the brand. You know what I mean? That they like to get out there. We like to use "get amongst it" as kind of our little like slogan or whatever. These dudes uh, embody that to the to the fullest. All of them. Good dudes. Great golfers. Also. Don't take it too like how, like to have a good time on yeah. the side. Rich Beam, major champion, won the PGA at Hazeltine, battling Tiger down the stretch. One of the greatest celebrations ever in the history the of shimmy. major championship golf, the shimmy. But found his way into TV now. He's getting ready to go play the PGA Tour Champions. Just one of my favorite personalities in the game of golf. No surprise that he's killed it at TV. Yeah, he's great with that. He's fun loving. Everyone likes him. He was the exact same way on tour. By the way, not only is major championship, but I was on property. We get into this as well. The winner of one of the craziest finishes in the history of the pga tour period 2002 international castle pines where steve lowry was just doing weird shit all over the property and ended up having to rich had to duck a 12 footer or so on the last hole to win that thing it's nuts he had a little stretch there late in 2002 uh, summertime all right well let's get to it here's rich beam on golf subpar all right we are out here at beautiful Greyhawk golf club the first major of the year i would say the johnny o twin fin and we are blessed to have an actual major champion here with us today three-time winner on the pj tour broadcast extraordinaire incredible dancer am i missing anything rich beam in the house I, you know what i actually think you guys kind of lost a bet 
by having me here because seriously, you guys are extraordinary at what you do. I've been a big mm. fan of your show for many years. I've told Colt, th- Colt this Coat, many Coat, times. No, it's like going around, Colt. <laughs> Listen, it, it's been a very fun day here at the uh, Twin Fin, but you guys are amazing at what you guys do. Have me on here, man. Well, first that's off, the most well, flattering. This, this we really appreciate time. it. But keep going, but yeah. you know, I, listen, stop it. But keep. I, I will. I'll keep going all, as long as you want me to. No, you are the best. First off, you are a major champion. You're a loyal listener. You have one of the best personalities in the game of golf. So why the hell wouldn't we have you on? I can't believe it took this long. Well, I well because I don't pass through Phoenix this, uh, you know that many times. True. You're busy, and uh, you know traveling around the world now. A CBS mm-hmm. full time on course analyst, dude. Let's give. Big oh, round of applause. Thank you. Clap it up. Thank you, Rich. Seriously. Thank you, Rich. Clap. Seriously. Clap. Much God, that's the nicest <laughs> intro we've listen, ever had. I, you know what? I just think do this for an hour. Should, listen, <laughs> Say something about me, Rich. <laughs> I think I should be interviewing you two derelicts. Ask us hour. anything, dude. Well, We're an open book. Well, you know, uh, so tell me, uh, last night, uh, what happened in your house? Oh. Never mind. Nope. Nope. Yeah. We don't want to go there. We'll leave that alone. Yeah, we'll leave that alone. We'll actually touch on that maybe before the show. No, you're good, brother. It's all. I'm over it. It's it's coming gone. But why wouldn't we? Our big thing, you know, our kind of our little catchphrase, get amongst it. That's the kind of what we embody. That's our brand. Nobody, I would say, embraces that more than you. You've been getting amongst it for a long time. I think that this life, you get one kind of go around. And if you're not out here having some fun with it all, then what are you doing? God Couldn't bless agree you. more. God bless the you. The three of us live life very similar, except he has two young kids and Yours are grown, and so I don't have any. Yeah, that might, well, means my life there are some people in this world that should not uh, replicate. <laughs> Good <laughs> Reproduce, point. replicate, Re- whatever. Replicate, yeah. Reproduce, <laughs> whatever. You whatever. It's you know, let's just make our own words up right now. You know, cause we're from that. Texas. Yeah. So. Well, let's. I want to talk a little bit about Texas because I'm fascinated. You are you were born in Phoenix, but you sure. grew up in El Paso. Yes. Which home Elite Trevino, the legend. Yeah. But I need to know what golf was like for you because I've heard there's some crazy gambling games down in El Paso. Yeah, there were definitely some crazy gambling games in El Paso uh, when I showed up there. In well, I was there for a little bit before that, but 1996 is when I really got my first taste of what the El Paso um, country club scene was like. And there was two games: a Wednesday and a Friday game. And you better bring it. <laughs> if you don't bring it, then don't bother showing up. Um, and, you know, here's the funny thing is it wasn't like it was a massive amount of money, but unless you played good, you were going to lose eight days a week. And and the games there were very simple. It was a is a quota. Uh, you had a partner, a high and low hat, mm-hmm. and you just pull the golf balls out and away you went. And it taught me how to how to make birdies mm-hmm. more than anything else. And I think that's what. You know, if you don't make birdies as a professional golfer, then what are you doing? I you're going to go sell yeah. cell phones. You're, you're going to go start sell a cell phones quick. <laughs> and podcasts yes. and go work for Sky Sports. There's no doubt about it. But <laughs> it, um, you know, what what it, it taught me more than anything else was how to make birdies and how to go low and not be afraid of going low. You know, the money was, was kind of secondary of it. But, listen, it was really good after a while. And when you don't have any money at the time, like, oh, we've all God. been in these games where you're like, this is maybe it's not the biggest number for everybody, but it's a hell of a big number for me. Listen, it I, matters. Listen, I remember my my the first year I worked there, I was making three hundred and twelve dollars and like forty eight cents every two weeks. That's solid. Listen, to me, dude, I am <laughs> got it going on. An EP. Uh, listen, yeah. I had I had the world by the tail because I had a hundred dollars rent. Wow. wow. What did you live in? The market was different. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had I I, did you live on I a had bicycle? no no no. I had a guy by the name of James Dennis who was a lawyer in town and he had just a, I mean he just he had a room that he just he rented out to me and between that and macaroni and cheese and pasta and all that and then a bar called Asatunas. Yeah, I mean I lived high Asatunas. on the hog. Yeah. High on the hog. No so who go, go to the gambling games real quick. You're yeah. playing I mean it was a quota game, high low hat, all that. Yeah. So who you were obviously in the low hat. Who else was in these games? I'm assuming you had some decent amateurs, some maybe higher handicaps. Were there other pros involved in this? Yeah, we had uh, J.P. Hayes, uh, Ryan Hytella. Oh, um, yeah, I forgot. Um, about uh, who else was there at that time? Um, There's a couple other pros that would come come blazing in. The one thing that we that we did have though is that 
any pro that would come through town, whether it was a former UTEP player or just a friend of a friend, they always had to play to the to the lowest handicap of of whoever was there. And in 1998, I was the low handicap. I was a plus seven. Ooh, that's tough to win a quota. I had to shoot 64 every time I teed it up, and I made I made money. And when guys would show up, like well, we want to play, and the pro Cameron Doan would say, "Sarge, you got to play." Yep, Sarge, you had to play to a plus seven, and the and the pros are like, what? "Never mind." Yeah. Seriously, yeah, and I'm they would say, as. "That's exactly <laughs> right." And they were like, "What do you mean I got to play to a plus seven? Because listen, my assistant pro is a plus seven. If you're not going to play to a plus seven, don't bother coming." And I can't tell you how many guys decided not to show up because I mean that's a lot of shot. That's tough to get back to. Them. That's a it's it's a hard deal. I mean, you've played El Paso yeah. Country Club a few times. You know, if you know how to play the golf course, you know, sixty four is not that difficult. But you you still gotta still, go produce it. Still still 64, gotta, 64. You still gotta yeah, you yeah. still gotta go produce it. I love it. We gotta go back just a second because you obviously you turned pro and then you stepped away from the game yeah. to sell cell phones. And what else did you sell up there in Seattle? Stereos? A car stereos, stereo stereo cell phones. Um, <laughs> listen, I, how did you choose did that? Did you just have a jacket that you opened up? Like, what do you need? I got cell phones, <laughs> I got stereos. Pretty I much, yeah. Caps, I, what I, do you mean, want? You know, I probably still have the jacket, too. Um, a no, I, I. So even, even back up a little bit quicker. So after college, I decided that I wanted to go be in the golf business because my dad, longtime pro, um, I just wanted to be around golf because that's just all I've known. And so I went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, took a job at West Rojo Country Club, and met this gal, got engaged, went out to, to Seattle with her, just, you know, chasing around because, you know, being in love. And, um, and so she – so I went out there, and I – the first job I ever interviewed at that I can remember I ever interviewed at was for Magnolia Hi-Fi – in Seattle, Washington, and I still to this day have no understanding why they hired me, because I must have been a drithering like, la, 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 la. I want a job, and that was it. And they hired me. You could sell. You're hired. I yeah. l- listen. I, I can sell anything, man. I believe that. What would you like me to sell you right now? You got any more stereos, Lana? I'm actually in the market for a lot of shit. The market for a lot of electronics right now. <laughs> I need a lot of. You got you a don't washer say. And dryer? You don't say. I mean, we are you know low. what? Let, listen, yeah. we'll, we'll leave that one alone, those sleeves, man. I know you had a rough morning. I need man. a lot of things right <laughs> now, bro. So sorry, but I'm glad you brought brother. that up because you got up to Seattle. That story is kind of well documented. You know, yeah. you know when you came out. Yeah, there's this backstory. He's selling car. He's selling cell phones. He's selling stereos. But you turned pro in '94. Give me what led you to to the point where like I need to do something else other than golf. Where were you playing? What were you doing? Listen, me turning pro in 1994 was was literally waking up after a probably a huge binge with my boys in Las Cruces, New Mexico, saying, "You know what? I don't want to be an amateur anymore. I'm gonna be a professional golfer for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm turning professional." Right now. That's, <laughs> That's how so did, good. That's how I did it. Yeah. That's exactly kind of how it, it, it was. And, you know, uh, you know, turning professional, I mean, anybody can. Anybody. Declare, yeah, you just do it. Except for Colt because, I mean, he procrastinated so long. Yeah, he takes a long time. Figure, he's slow. Slow I with took it. like two weeks. Actually, he did it too early. I did it too early. I yeah. skipped the Masters. Yeah, that was a bad idea. Well, let, 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 we won't go to that right yet yeah because i'm not interviewing me i'm interviewing you i know but i want to interview you later on about that um but i mean that's how it was back then and i knew that i was going to be around the game forever and a day because my dad was and i i i love and miss my dad um but i remember when i was a kid we lived out at white sands missile range in just outside las cruces and i would go out to the golf course in the morning and my dad would be out there mowing greens, fairways. After that, he'd come in and flip burgers, pour beers, and give lessons, re-whip, re-whip driver shafts, things like that back in the day when he had to do that. Mm-hmm. That's and club just, pro. That's club pro. And yeah. my dad was the ultimate club pro. So this game, it's it's been instilled in me my entire life. This is the only thing that I've ever known in my world is golf. You don't think Omar Uresti went about club pro life the way your dad did? Who can fold a shirt better? (laughs) (laughs) 
So my dad was an amazing club pro. I don't know who you were talking <laughs> okay, about. Perfect. Let's get that right. one. Perfect. <laughs> Edit. No problem. <laughs> Edit that one out. Uh, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> quick question though, because all right, you, you stumble out of bed. You say I'm turning pro. You got to play in some stuff to turn pro. So I assume you're playing state opens, mini tour. What got to the point where you're like, I hate this. I'm gonna go to Seattle and now and just give up golf for a bit. You know, it wasn't. It, I never hated the game, and, and, and in fact, I just you know, I I think that. Honestly, I was just chasing. I was chasing a girl. I chased a girl out to Seattle and decided that you know I want to do something different. And it wasn't anything that I disliked about the game. I it just you know I want to do something different. And so we went out there. And honestly, <laughs> funny enough, the first two places I went to go try and get a job were at golf courses, Seattle Golf Club, um, and I forget the name of the other one. And no, they wouldn't hire I me. I said nah. no. And that's fine. Yeah. Listen, it was great. I yeah. mean, it, it was. It actually worked out so good for me because I just I'm a golf junkie, <laughs> like y'all. I mean, I listen. This is this is the only thing I know. And so uh, to step away from the game and to actually have a I don't say real job, but to <laughs> to actually have a to clock in with my Magnolia Hi-Fi card that I would swipe in and out every day. Interesting. It's a Very shock to the system. And then but you, Different. you you come back to the game. Yeah. And, like, you know, we, we like to bag on our buddies and stuff, but your buddy J.P. Hayes wins out on tour. Yeah. And it was was it a moment like, wow, I can kick the shit out of him. <laughs> I need to be out there playing. Yeah. You know, I, so what happened was in, in – I think it was when Stankowski won in – I think it was 1990 – sorry, 1995. He won in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And – I just, you know what? I need to kick the rust off these golf clubs and go out and hit some golf balls. And it's not like I was best friends with Paul. I just knew him from UTEP when I was playing at New Mexico State. And it just kind of gave me a little bit of motivation to go out there and maybe get back into the game a little bit. And when I moved to El Paso and took the job there, and I was playing golf against JP quite a bit, and JP was and JP was a hell of a player, two-time winner on the PGA Tour, Buick and uh, John Deere. I just, you know, I was in awe of him because he really was a – his short game is to die for. But what happened was is that I started beating him, like, a lot. (laughs) Like, a lot. And listen, and and JP will kind of say the same thing, like, I was not scared of beating him. Mm-hmm. And usually when you tee it up against a, you know, when I was a younger guy, teeing it up against a PGA professional tour player, like, crawling a hole. I never crawled in a hole against him. In fact, it motivated me to just absolutely go out there and try and, and beat him as bad as I could. And it was, that was the best learning experience I could ever have had to, to motivate me to where I was now or, or where I am now. When you came back after playing JP, and that gives you the like, I'm beating this guy. If he's winning out there, I can at least play. Everyone knows you got back on tour, but how did you go back about getting your card? You're like, okay, I'm back in this. Let me go to Q school. That story kind of hasn't been told. Yeah. So what happened was is that in 1998, um, funny, I think it was in 1997. If you won the section championship as an assistant pro, you got automatically into second stage Q nice. school instead of first stage, right? But that changed in 1998 for whatever reason. So I went to uh, section championships in Socorro, New Mexico, and I won by 14. Okay. Good plan. Not a bad deal. Good round. Good, yeah, good not plan. Good not plan. But when I won, I thought that I got into second stage, and I didn't. So I had to go to first stage. So first stage – ironically enough, was out here at Talking Stick. Mm, the stick. And, and I went out and I shot 67 in the final round to make it through. And the second stage was in Houston at um, Deerwood. Yep. And sh- I don't even remember what I shot. The- Ten cup. That's what I used yep, to go yep, down there. Yep. Yeah. I think, I think I shot like one or two under the final round there to finish top ten. And then finals was out in Palm Springs, and I was Mike Weir won it that that year, but I was one of 
four players, I think, to shoot every round under par. Very nice. And so that's, first and stage was the grind, though. You need? Did you need the 67 to get out? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, Whoa. on after Saturday's round, I don't even know where I was at. After Saturday's round, um, one of my dearest close friends, Kirk Hansen, um, lives here in town. We went out that night and uh, kind of tied one on a little bit because I was thinking that I'm not going to get out of first stage and went out there. And I think, I, funny enough, I think I shot like even par on the front nine. And then I, I finished like five under the back nine. I mean, I, I, I don't know that, but I know I played really good the back nine and when i walked into the scoring area i was shocked i'm like are you sure like yeah. really I, I i made it through the second stage and he goes yeah you're in i'm like <laughs> cool. i started laughing yeah. I, mean, I started laughing because like this, this this shouldn't be happening yeah this should not be happening to me well that's what the thing is then you make it through all the way through finals you yeah. get your pga tour card oh. you win on the pga tour oh. like was it just kind of like holy hell everything's happening so fast you know it yeah that's actually a that's a very valid point. Everything happens so fast because it shouldn't happen this way. It should not go from me making making thirteen thousand a year working at El Paso Country Club to winning the Kemper Open in my eighth start on the PGA Tour and making a half a million dollars. This should not happen. This is not real world stuff. This is fictional. But yet that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I don't know why it happened this way. Mark O'Meara, though, gave me a great insight to it. He goes, you know what? Sometimes things happen so quickly you can't appreciate them. Mm -hmm. But he also said, take advantage of it. And that's exactly what happened. I, I sat there, and I after I won the Kemper, and, and I had a couple of not-so-good years after that, though, it's, you know, when you have an opportunity to play at the highest level, you got to take advantage of it 24-7. No doubt. He did, and then 2002 rolls around, and I want to go to one of my favorite events of all time because I was actually on property for this. 2002 International. Were you Castle really? Pines, stand up. Yeah, oh. I was on property for you, Richie. And, he was uh, rooting for Shane Lowry. Yeah. <laughs> well, Steve Lowry. Steve Lowry. Yeah, well, Shane, Shane, like Lowry, Shane, was, uh, Shane, Shane Lowry would have been like 19 yeah. at the moment. Yeah, I like them both. That's okay. Yeah. But I was out there, the shenanigans that was going on. I didn't oh get to God. see the double eagle on set, but, I mean, we can we can rewind. I mean, he got up and down from the lake on 11 for birdie. He holes out the wedge on yeah. 15 for eagle, par 17 or 16, the double eagle on set. All of a sudden, like, you're looking yeah. good. You're sitting pretty, and then all of a sudden, holy shit, I might not win this thing. Were you were aware? I know I know what happened on eighteen, but were you aware leading up to this? Like this guy wasn't even on the front page, and now all of a sudden, he's got a twelve footer to win. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yes, all of that and and more. I, I'll never forget standing on the eighteenth tee box, and I have a nine point lead. <laughs> and in that point, crazy it, dude, listen, crazy. Listen, listen it should be done. Listen, and there is a there is a a sign. In the locker room, the PGA Tour says, we expect competitors to put their best foot forward, meaning you have to try on every single – like if you have a nine-point lead and you're in the final group and everybody else is done, you just can't pick up your golf ball and walk. Yeah, in. and say I'm done. You have to hit a shot. You know, you can hit – you can hit 14 golf balls out of bounds. I always and still wanted win. that, to, like the stable, because it's a stable for format. Yeah, exactly. I wanted some guy to have the tournament, you know, when they used to do it, or still do it, Reno Tahoe. Be mathematically, it's over. Him sit down on 18 and say, bring the trophy right here. Hit, <laughs> that, hit it backwards. Yeah. And, that's, and that's exactly why the PGA Tour yeah. didn't yeah. want that. You got to put your best foot forward and try, right? So I'm sitting there on the 18th tee box. And I'm playing with Mark Brooks, and I am grinning earlobe to earlobe because I'm thinking, I got this thing wrapped up. And I drill it right down the middle. And, and by the time I get to my second shot, I'm only a point up. <laughs> Wait, you heard the roar because the roar happened? was nuts. I can I, hear it from way across. I heard the roar, and, and David Faraday has been with – was with me when I won the Kemper, when I won the International, and when I won the PGA. So, but at the International, we're walking down the 18th fairway. We hear the roar, and and I go, "What happened?" I go, "Craig Barlow make three? He goes, "No." I said, "Lowry make three? He goes, "No." I go, "What happened?" He goes, 
goes, Lowry made two. And I look at him, and I said, my lead is one? <laughs> <laughs> and For the he, audio listeners, that was a middle uh, finger the, one. That yeah. was a middle that finger a single one. Single digit, yeah. yeah single awesome. digit, yeah, number one. And he goes, yep. And I'm going, You've got to be kidding me. you got to So you be found out in the fairway, though. You knew because I mean, the roar little, happened. I mean, I mean, by the time I hit this tee shot to the second shot, I mean, halfway down the fairway, my nine-point lead went to a one-point lead. That's so lead. crazy. It's, it's the but wildest that's tournament cool of all that time. Format, that too. is the greatest thing about that. And format. that golf course specifically for it, yes. it allows for that type of yes. shit to happen. You probably had your victory speech already, like, i, I got to thank my you know, this sponsor, this guy. You know, funny enough, I mean – I don't think that anybody ever has a victory speech, you know, and I'm sure you didn't when you were winning uh, your your amateur and I had a and lot. I never got to give them rich. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. I was actually looking at Cole. <laughs> no, I was telling that. you about me though. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, it's okay. I, I had a lot. That. I still I, have so, them ready. I'm sorry. Anyways, so yeah, I didn't I didn't have anything. I'm just, when you're walking down the fairway, you you literally you're just like you're still like this until you once you get done. Then it's okay to just like, you know, lose your mind. But I, I seriously, I will never forget when I understood that I went from a nine point lead to a it's, one. It's point one of the wildest finishes in PJ Tour history. I mean, it's just. I was just like unbelievable. And so when, when I finished out, went up and signed my scorecard and then came back down and I saw. I saw Lowry, and he had this 12-footer. Yeah. He hit a great shot in 18. He hit a great shot. Pins front left. He hit it left of it. He had this putt straight up the hill. And there's no reason in the world he should have missed this. No reason. And to this day, I'm pretty sure he'll tell you it's the best putt he ever hit that never went in. And when it did not go in, it was like, oh, my word. Because it was – I. Never expected it to be that close, to be fair, uh, when I was standing on 17 tee box, much less 18 tee box, and yet here it is. Yeah. That's one for him, I feel like. He can't even be mad that he lost because it's Oh, like, gosh, no. My God, no, hold out. Hold six made irons. Him, no, no, like, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. It's no. just like, hey, I gave it a hell of a run. Probably oh, should have won that I mean, one and I didn't. She, I mean, he threw everything, including the, you know, the kitchen sink at it. But, I mean, what a great finish that was. I mean, that, that truly is – more so than uh, that that to me is the the tournament that I will never forget all the emotions that yeah. that happened. I with can that. remember like almost all of it being there. And when his ball landed at twelve, you had to think in your mind, I'm sure, like it's done, dude. He's hold out from everywhere. He just hold a six iron wedge up and down from the lake. This is there's no way this doesn't go in. So the story I was told, this and you'll appreciate this, is that is that when I made Eagle on on seventeen, you know, this was a foregone conclusion. And and the men's grill at El Paso Country Club is is legendary, mm-hmm. and 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 somebody told JP, who everybody was sitting in there, this is done. And JP goes, yeah, this is absolutely. He's got he's got this in the bag. When Lowry hold it on seventeen, JP was taking a swig out of his Miller Light and fell over because he was like not not because he was drunk because he's like. <laughs> Oh, yeah, cannot I cannot believe. believe this just happened. Like, it was just yeah. – this This is, like, not real. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. So. But at the end of the day, you won. You deserve to win. Yep. But we got to go two weeks forward. Yeah. Because that's when the world yep. really got to know Rich Beam. <laughs> up at Hazeltine, Chaska, Minnesota. Shout out to all the boys up there. Fernie, Ryan, all those guys. Oof. Our man over here, you know. Pat- by the way. Patrick Hunt. Patrick Hunt as a – you might not like him at the end of this. We'll get to that later. Are but, you kidding me? Can oh. you, I mean, seriously, <laughs> can you not? And y- y'all folks can't see this because we're on air right now. But you know, he is—he's got some sexy hair. He's a beautiful man. Yeah, he's a beautiful he looks like man. the most interesting man in the but world. Let's talk about Hazeltine, though. Okay, talk to me. I mean, you got the job done. One of the best celebrations ever. But we got to talk about the final round because okay. here you are. It basically comes down to a two-man race yep. there on the back nine against a, a fellow named Tiger Woods. Yep. Who just birdies the last four on you. Yep. A couple groups in front of you. Yep. Take it back to what you were thinking. Because obviously, we all said Tiger roars are different than other people's roars. Yep. And you, I'm guessing you know what's going on up there. Take us through that back nine on Sunday. So, so I was playing so good that I didn't even, I didn't care whoever, whoever anybody else was. And I think we've all been in this. Not you, but I think we've all been in this. Damn it, Rich! <laughs> Thought we had a moment earlier. We did. Not okay. you, and we and we still will. Okay, we still will. All right. 
<laughs> but you get into this moment where when you're playing so good, you don't know, you, you're almost oblivious to everything going on around you. Yes, I heard the roars um, coming down the stretch. And and I'm not going to lie. I mean, it, it's not, they weren't oblivious. You heard him, but I think that I deflected it because knowing that he was playing with Fred Funk, mm -hmm. and Fred was a great story that week because his he, he talked emotionally about his his brother going through rehab and how tough it was, everything that was going on with him and his family, and every time I heard the massive roars going up, I got like Fred, way to go, buddy, yeah. making another birdie, and I knew full well that it wasn't you know Fred, yeah. but you have to deflect. Because if you think about what is actually transpiring and what's going on, you're gonna you're gonna be mm -hmm. lost. You're gonna be done. And I think that's what Tiger did best is that he got everybody else to think and pay attention to what he was doing. And I never bought into it mm -hmm. that week. Listen, I buy into it 51 weeks a year, 52 weeks a year now because of what I do. But back then, it didn't bother me, and I didn't care. The roars were obvious, but I didn't pay attention to it. Do you think, obviously, you can't go back in time, but do you think it was a blessing to you that you weren't paired with him? Oh, absolutely. There, I mean, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. I mean, I made a, what, an 8, 12, 10-footer on the uh, 18th green on Saturday to get in the final group with Justin Leonard. And that was probably the biggest putt yeah. of the week for me because I was not paired with him um, on Sunday. And I would have been, if I if I had missed it, I'd been four back of Justin, but I was only three back going in on Sunday. But it, four back or three back, it wouldn't have mattered. My life would have been, I truly believe it would have been completely different. I don't think that I would have won. Had you ever been paired with him prior? If you hadn't made that? No. So that would have been the first time. That Talk would have time, been the Sunday that, at a major. That would have been the first time, yep. Do you think winning just a few, you're only a few weeks removed from the international at that time, yep. being that you had, all right, you got a lot of money, you just got a two-year exemption, you got all that stuff, check that box off. Do you think that lessened the, maybe the, like, the pressure for you on that Sunday? Like, I would love to win this, but if I don't, I'm still good. There's no doubt. I We were playing a practice round on Tuesday. Um with a very, very boring group. It was <laughs> Pat Perez, uh, John Daly, Robert mm. Gomez, and Fuzzy Zeller. Yeah, a little so, I mean, couple there was, of church mouse. I mean, it was – I struggled to see why I even played with these guys because there was zero gambling – oh, no, no, right. See, those are the best stories, though. Those, oh, yeah. The gambling yeah, I wanna, gambling we're going to circle back to this as such. So, Fuzzy on number five. I hit driver on number five at Hazeltine, dog leg right to left. And Fuzzy goes, well, why are you hitting this? Why don't you two iron, eight iron? I said, Fuzzy, I just won two weeks ago. I've got 1.6 in the bank. And I got a two-year exemption. I'm hitting driver everywhere. <laughs> That's nice. Should. Yeah. Everywhere. And he laughed. And he goes, all right. And so after I won, he was one of the f one of the uh, two different callers that called in. I didn't do something with the golf channel. Mm -hmm. And he called in and he goes, he goes Beamer, my son. You were right, That's and it was awesome. and it was yeah, it was it was amazingly fun. So if Lowry makes that putt on eight on the seventy second at Castle Pines, do you think you play that week differently or more no. nervous or no. no same deal? No, I listen. It, I couldn't listen. At the end of the day, you can't control what somebody else does, right? You're right, though. It it would have been a very bitter taste in my yeah. mouth because I shot. I think I shot sixty three on Sunday at Castle Pines, and to not win. Yes, it would have, yeah, it would have been a little bit different. Um, would I have not won the PGA? I don't know. I just uh, have that cushion and that comfort. Like, I know I'm out here for know, two years. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that I still would have gone into the PGA week with the same amount of confidence that I had when I arrived. I mean, I don't think that because I didn't lose – I wouldn't have lost the yeah. international, right? Yeah. Somebody would have come up sure. and beat me. And done right? something weird. So it is not – so it wouldn't have been like I did something wrong or I choked or I lost for whatever reason. I just didn't win. I, 
granted, there are so many what ifs and why not. Listen, we could talk about this for decades, but you know what? At the end of the it day, happened. hey, you're a major champion. Chicken dinner. Things you're top double, 20 double in the world dinner. after that. A book <laughs> is being written about you oh, and yes. your legendary caddy. We're not going to talk about the author because I hate that man. But the oh, book, Bud, God. Sweat, mm. and Teas. we got to talk a little bit about it. Strong. So, yeah, so the author followed me around for a couple of weeks back in, what was it, 1999? And, um, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff left out, man. Yeah. Well, your I'm, caddy was an absolute legend. Oh, he, which Steve, we're going to get to. It. Steve Duplantis is, yeah. Rest in peace, Steve Duplantis. Rest legend. in peace. God bless. Love him. I mean, if, if, if this was a show that we could do, um, as we call in Sky Sports, on the red button, <laughs> where you can just kind of let things fly. We could tell some seriously funny stories. However, we're going to keep it neat and clean. Um, I love Steve. Steve was, Steve was, um, was one of those individuals that uh, I'll never forget for the rest of my life, thankfully. He was with Jim Furyk for many years, caddied for me um, at the Kemper Open in 99, and... Um, this is one of the funniest things ever. So I think it was was it Norelco? The Razor? Yeah, there there was Shaver? so there was a back then there was a a company. I, I want to say it was Norelco that they they set aside thirty thousand dollars for the caddies for the year. Okay. So for every second of airtime that the, the visor, the, the logo got on air, the caddy would get $100 every second of airtime. Nice. Yeah, he won all of that in the, <laughs> in the week That's in, awesome. in, in camp. He absolutely, he actually had to get paid $45,000. That is fantastic. He, he knew where the blew, camera was. <laughs> he blew the entire thing out of the water. They had to make a new check for him because it, they only – they only garnered thirty thousand dollars. He made forty five thousand dollars. That's fantastic. Hell of a deal. I mean, for the unbelievable fella. for every second. And he was sitting there right next to me the entire time. Same visor as you had just said Norelco on it. And it was just like, holy smoke. He got so much airtime. Tell us this. Did you did you make more or less than that off the book? You and I made the same amount off my book. <laughs> really? So you did just that, like, hey, you can follow me around and talk you about and whatever. You and I made the same. That is ridiculous. You and I made the same amount of money off my book. How did you let that, that happen? Book. Naiveness. Yeah. I like, listen in 1999. Listen, going back to it, I was making thirteen thousand yeah. dollars a year in 1998. Do you realize my world? Change so drastically from 1998 to 19. I mean, it was unbelievable, and and 90. I was so naive. You got to so be the naive. only dude then or now that I think would just hey follow me around, especially for a guy who likes to get after it and go out and have some beers and do things like that. Hey, follow me around and write a book and just it's all good. You you take care of it. You know what. <sighs> No one would do part that. of it. Part of it was a lot of fun, but a part of it now looking back on it was like, man, this is kind of sneaky. I'm like, I'm not too sure I trust this guy after a while. Well taken. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but it's when it got presented to me, I'm like, this is the greatest thing about, you know, this is going to be so fun. After a while, though. You just kind of got the feeling that this is not going to be that fun. And there are some hidden things in there like, he may not have my best interest. I was going to ask you, so final product. I'm assuming you didn't get final cut. Like, here's the book. You can edit whatever you want and take it out. It just comes out. He gave me What's the galleys. So he gave me the galleys. And I, I signed off on them. The only thing I said is, like, I hate how you use – all the language you know if you if we're sitting here and we drop an f-bomb there's a great context because you can hear it in our voices there is a way that we say it and how we say it when it's written it looks so 
much differently. And that's the thing that I hated. And I just thought, you know what? This is not good. I mean, I just thought you get you, you need to take out a lot of these, you know, F bombs, the the language that we were using, because in the context that we were having it, it was fun and funny, but when you write it, it looks completely different. Yep. Looking totally different. That's why I think totally it was a different. huge leap of faith. But like, yeah, sure, follow me around, write whatever you and, want, and I trust you. And so, yeah, it, it was a huge leap of faith. And um, but at the end of the day, same thing. You and I got paid the same amount. I think people though genuinely like like there's some language in there that's bad. I think guys genuinely like to see that side. And like, here's a non. I don't want to call it robot, but here's a guy that does things a little different. He yeah. beats to his own drum. He's a regular dude, just like my group of guys that we hang out with. We talk the same way. We do the same things. I think even though it can look bad PR-wise, then the vast majority of people probably read it and were like, wow, Beam's like that. He's like me. He's like our group. He's just really good. Exactly. But let me ask you, let me, let me put it to you this way, though. You know, would you want to have a no. book written? Mm -mm. Okay. Zero. That's why I'm saying like, it's a <laughs> leap of faith. But I think and, people and, like and, it. And looking back on it, you know, I've always said I'd write, I would love to have a second book written about about what's going on beyond this. And to be fair, I wouldn't want to get paid a single dollar for the second book either. But I would like I'd like to have a certain guy write it for me because I'd like to have people understand that. Listen, I'm yes, I am a degenerate. To a you're a golfer to, to a to a point. However, there's a different side of me that is out there and and yet there was nothing like that in the book and it and this guy took a i mean he went out there and uh, i think our feelings are very kind of known very for similar. That, but yeah it's yeah. kind of like that's the author right. you yeah. know yeah. the deal yeah, that's absolutely. the stick but well i, I think overall people liked yeah. it but i i think yeah you know, i think every leap. golfer looking back on their career wishes they could have done more i mean you had a hell of a career three wins major championship but now you've absolutely killed it at tv what <laughs> What got you in to, to broadcasting? Because you've been over at Sky Sports since 2015. Yeah. Everybody loves you. What well, got you into it? I, I'm fortunate because of that. I, I think what happened, Colt, was the fact that when, when I was on TV, I was honest. Mm -hmm. I was brutally honest. I didn't pull any punches. I wasn't, didn't say things to, to make people warm and fuzzy and... I was just me. And I think that what happened was is that between the the folks on TV and the writers, they put something inside of my head that said you should be on TV. And it never entered my mind that I should ever be on TV. But after a while, they said, "Listen, you'd be fantastic at doing this because you're honest. You're brutally honest. You are just a person." And, and so what happened was, is that after a while, when I started playing poorly, a lot, <laughs> and a lot, um, I just thought, you know what, there's got to be something else out there for me. And I could not wait to get out of the game of golf and to get on this side of the microphone. And how it all came about was... And happenstance was in 2012, was on the European tour, missed the cut in Switzerland by a stroke again. And I went down to the TV compound on Saturday morning and said, listen, I'd like to do something with TV. And my my boss now, who was a producer back then, he goes, "Have you do you have any experience? I said, absolutely none. He goes, well, can't really help you out, but go get some experience. Love to chat with you later on. Three years later, worked for a couple years for Golf Channel, um, doing encore stuff, and Sky Sports took a bigger interest in the PGA Tour, and they let me loose and hired me up, and it was been it's been amazing. Yeah, and your your honesty is one of the reasons why people do love you on TV. They love listening to you because you'll say what you think. But we like we've had other broadcasters on, and we've had Brandel, Noda, a bunch of different guys, and like Brandel specifically is like you know my job is to criticize these guys when it's necessary so i go i don't want to say he goes out of his way but he's like i don't need to have a relationship with every guy and be buddies with these guys and be on the range and yucking it up what's as a player i feel like that's a that's a fine line to walk like i want to be buddies i know a bunch of these guys but i also have to be critical what's your take on that with these young guys you know funny enough i actually uh um 
I, I listened to your podcast that you had Brandel on, and I actually specifically went up to him and said, you know what, you're wrong. I said, you do need to have a relationship with the guys on the driving range. You do need to be friends with them to a point because, listen, you you can't judge everything that you see just by how they're hitting the golf ball, how they're swinging this and that. You have no idea whether or not, you know, this player's, you know, mother is sick. You don't have, I mean, you need to understand what is going on in these players' worlds because what happens inside the ropes for a player, as we all definitely know, it is partially golf-related and, and inside your mental, but, I mean, we are not robots. If if somebody in your family is not doing well, if, if anything, anything, anything off course, anything off course is mm-hmm. going on, it's going to affect you inside the ropes, and there's no getting away from it. This is the real world. This is how it all happens. I look at it not from a – I look at it from a, a – it's almost like a passion project, I guess. When I see players, I want to know, obviously, how they're swinging, how they're doing. I actually spend more time with their caddies mm. than I do the players because I think the caddies have a better understanding of what's going on with the player because <laughs> – the player, as we all know, you know, oh, everything's great. I'm doing yeah. this and that. And sometimes, like, yeah, no, that's that's actually horseshit. Yeah. Trust the process. <laughs> that's the, the truth serum, the caddy. Yeah. That's, and you also see the caddies out at night. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, but I mean, the caddies are, they're, they're the truth. I mean, yeah. they are the reality of it, right? I mean, because the caddies aren't going to tell, I mean, they know what's going on. I mean, the player might have it in their brain that this is, you know, is amazing and this and that. And the caddy's going, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, no. And they're shaking their head in the background because it it's, you know, I'll tell you one one quick story. And I love Rory McIlroy. And and I love Harry. But he goes, we were at the concession last year. And we're in the back of 10 Green. And they were talking about equipment. I was talking about equipment. And Harry just goes, yeah, I don't know what he's doing with this, this stuff. His irons are terrible right now. His shafts are awful. He's got like these triple X stiff shafts, this and that. And he's like, they're not good. But whenever Rory hit a shot, Harry was like, oh, that's great, bro. That's mm-hmm. great. Turns out, a couple weeks later, Rory goes back, switch shafts out, and he starts playing better. Caddies have, the, they, they know what's going on. Mm-hmm. The players, we all get into our minds that everything is great, everything is dandy. BS. And even if it's not, they'll tell you that as a media guy, everything's as, great and fine and dandy. They're not going to be like, my as, shafts suck and my equipment's all messed up. Right? They're not going to do that to their sponsors. That's exactly yeah. right. That's, so go ask the caddies. Yeah, I agree with you. As, as a former player and as one of the more popular guys on tour, like when you're walking inside the ropes doing your job, do players acknowledge you at all? Or is it, you know, you're doing your job, I'm doing my job? I, you know what? I try and stay away from them. And, and that's not. Patrick Hunt, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Patrick Hunt, ladies and gentlemen. Johnny on the spot. We just gained three Johnny more female followers. Spot. Exactly. Um, I try and stay away from the players yeah. as, as much as I can because I don't want to be a part of the action. I want to – as as much as we are part of the action inside the ropes, I think I think that my job is to, is to kind of look at the lie and read what they're – going through when they're having the conversation with the caddy you know every once in a while i'll have a conversation with mm-hmm. the player and or the caddy but i you know i try and stay away from that i mean i just don't it i don't know i in a sense i actually wish i i had a better relationship with with the players and the caddies but i also feel like not like Brandel's situation, but, you know, I, I need to separate myself a yeah. little bit because I do enjoy – I mean, I'm a big fan of this game. That's why we're in this game, right? Mm-hmm. We're fans. We are mm-hmm. definitely fans. But I just need to have a little bit of separation, and I don't want to get in their way. Although I, I, I do have to say a couple of times at the Ryder Cup, <laughs> when Jordan would come over and we'd talk about a few things, it was it was really kind of Jordan funny. Jordan talks to everybody. It's unbelievable. Jordan talks – I mean, and it's just – it's kind of like Lee Trevino. It's just nervous energy. Yeah. 
He's it just is. burning. He's burning nervous energy, and I just sit there and listen. I'm the same way when I'm in the fairway and, here, and I have Jordan's group. I he know. like comes up to me like I'm playing with him, and he's talking. I'm like, Bud, I got the mic right, right. here. Say it <laughs> into this. Yeah, Say here. it into this. this Tell me how you really better. feel. This uh, would be great. Have TV. you yeah, ever I said agree. anything about somebody or been too critical to where afterwards you were like, damn, maybe that was too much, uh, or somebody's approached you and said, hey, Rich, uh, I took offense to this. So the one time that I did was at the U.S. Open, and um. Gosh, I can't believe I'm going to forget this guy's name right now. English guy. Oh, my gosh. Tommy Fleetwood. You and Ian no, oh, no, no, Tom, listen, listen. I have Lee a man crush on Tommy. I know you listen, do. Listen, Tommy Fleetwood, listen, I'd make out with him right now if I could. <laughs> I would, if Tommy were right here, I would make out with him right now. The hair? I have a feeling you I know what one of the clips all is going to be. From all swing. of it. Listen, this guy is still like, oh, He's the full package. Oh, huh? Jesus. Wow. Well, this is getting are comfortable. We really, are we going to the, 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 really gonna the play groan this? was a little more. Are we really going to play this? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so we're going to write a book. So, about this. so the par four third at at the uh, U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. Um. Oh my god, I can't believe. It. So, th- this pro from the U.K. hits his shot and he and he chunks it and leaves it short, and then he chunks it again. He ends up making five from, like, 70 yards away, and he kind of berates his caddy. And at every single point, I mean, he, he looks at his caddy after every single shot, and I'm like, dude, get over yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, listen, you hit these bad shots. Your caddy didn't didn't do anything wrong. And so he actually called me out on Twitter a little bit, and I apologize for that a little bit. But I'm like, I'm sorry, dude, but you are – you hit every shot poorly after that gorgeous drive. Why is it your caddy's fault? Yeah. Why are you blaming someone else for your inadequacies from, you know, trying to be too perfect all the time? And it's like, come on, guys. Listen, how many times have players looked at their caddies and, and be like, how did that happen? Uh, cause you hit it. Yeah. <laughs> that you suck. Yeah. Well, I mean, seriously. <laughs> How many times does the caddy hit a shot? 0.0. Yeah. You got to blame it on somebody. That's what tour pros do. Okay. Yeah. And some of it's justified when you say something like that. Like, yeah, it wasn't your caddy's fault that you flubbed it from 60, but it, sometimes well, the, like, the is, verbiage maybe doesn't listen, come off. Listen, you're, you're, you're blaming somebody that is – listen, you're blaming somebody that is closest to you, that is rooting for you yeah. more than anybody else in the world besides your wife and accountant maybe. Listen – you have a guy that is literally three feet away from you that wants the best for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I find that when players blame caddies, I find that hysterical. And I will. that's the only time I will trash a player is when he starts yelling yeah. at their caddy. I'm like, dude, yeah. yeah it's that's the fault. golfer DNA. Blame somebody else. As, mu- as much as you do love doing TV, though, I know, I mean, you're a competitor yes. deep down and you love yes. playing the game. Yep. How much are we going to see you out on PJ Tour Champions? Not that much this year. Um, you know, I, I I do love competing, but I played eight events in 2021, 2022, maybe six or so. Mm-hmm. I'm not fully exempt. Uh, it's a misnomer that, you know, since you win a major, you're fully exempt on the Champions Tour. That's not accurate. Um, I, if I play six events, I'll be happy. And But I'm going to treat it just like I do every week. This is this is a game. Mm-hmm. This is fun. I'm not looking to go back out on tour anymore. I don't want to play 25 events full time. I want to play. If I could play 10 events, that'd be kind of nice. But I don't, I don't even know if I want to play that many. Yeah. I want to play enough to satisfy uh, my competitive desire and to. Um, just gonna say, it. I want to stick it to some people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I want to stick it to a couple it's people. Competitor. That's yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and then after that, I'm done. Like you said, you have a blast playing this game. I do. And I heard recently you might have made a hole in one down in Mexico that was rather enjoyable. Mm. Car? Well, I did. Nissan? I did not make a hole in one. Okay. Well, my oh. um, information has been. We have shitty sources, <laughs> Rich. Is what we're trying to say. He's sitting over there. <laughs> oh, he's no, no, oh no, 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 no. You don't have you don't have shitty sources. You have somebody that wants to pawn it off. So I actually <laughs> took a video of my man Patrick Hunt 
making a holy one hole in one on I think it was the Pacifico course 17 down in Punta Mita. Uh, and all you folks listening, Punta Mita is the greatest place on earth. Go there and tell them that I sent you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> not a shameless plug at all. <laughs> that is not a shameless plug at all. Um, but <laughs> we played the back nine without any shoes on, and there might have been some clear substances that rhyme with tequila um, in our cups. And Patrick hits his shot, and he hits it. Like, I didn't hit that good, you know, a little off the toe. And – it goes in. I've got this on video, and I am going monkey nuts. I am I am absolutely going crazy for about thirty seconds, and the very last thing I said, "We're done playing golf, right?" Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, and that's it. it. Yeah. So so funny enough. Fast forward about three minutes later, we go up to the green, pull the golf ball out of the hole. We go up to the left hand side of eighteen fairway, and I've got this speaker on in the cart, and I'm still going crazy. And I've got this thing full blast playing the video once again. And there's this guy over in the house that we did not know about. He comes over. He goes, hey, is everything okay? I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm really sorry we're loud. Um, my buddy just made a hole in one, and we're just, like, too loud. And he goes, oh, that's fantastic. So turns out this guy went to UT. Um, he has a staff of about 10. The guy came over. One of the guys came over with a platter full of beer. And we walked through his pool to get to the bar underneath, I mean, this house. And we can go on and on. But anyways, we sat there. And for about 45 minutes afterwards, it was the greatest experience of my life because this guy's got this house that is unbelievable in Punta Mita. Punta <laughs> go to Punta Mita. Punta Mita. Punta Mita. Find Mita. this dude. Punta Mita. This Longhorn. Yep, absolutely. It sounds like he's doing all right. Oh, he's not doing He's too okay? Bad. He's, you know what? He's, he's going to make it okay. Last real question for me, like before we get to some of the fun stuff, you seemed like when you played and you kind of touched on it at the PGA, like you had fun when yes. you were golf. You were out there, you enjoyed it. I think maybe that's coming from uh, you sold cell phones for a while. You know the other side, right? It wasn't just come out, boom, everything's in front of you. Do you think there are any guys out there right now that you see playing with that same kind of enjoyment of the game, or does it seem more like this is more business? Everybody's head down. Woe is me if the sky is falling if I'm not playing good. It is so much more of a business these days, um, but in, but also, it's just to say in a different way though that yes, there are guys out there that are making so much money and yet still having fun, right? I mean, I think Justin Thomas is is the guy right now that gets it. I think he's out there, he's grinding, but to me, he is the young player that is accomplishing everything and yet having fun in the same breath. I mean, I look at Justin Thomas and he has a smile on his face. He's, he's quick with the chat. He, he understands that this is a game right now. And I think part of that goes to the fact that his dad is a, uh, you know, is a club a pro. Mm -hmm. yeah. Victor yeah. Hovland would be a guy I would say like, if I had to pick a Victor guy right Hovland, now, yeah. like who most is most similar to you yeah. out there. I feel like Victor, he plays bad. He's smiling and he's interviewing. He plays great. He's smiling. He's interviewing. He has got, he's awesome. He has got the most infectious yeah. smile in the game. He's awesome. There is no doubt. And loaded with talent. Oh, he's going to be world But he's like, I suck at chipping. You know, like yeah. no, go, no other pro comes out and be like, I suck at this thing. He's just fine with it. Yeah, but he, he does suck at and chipping. And it's gotten better, but <laughs> it, that's how good he hits it, though. He it still is can still, win. It's still painful to watch, though. And I, it, listen, it, he is a ball striker's oh, dream. Yeah, I did give I'd up say, chipping to hit it like him. Eight I days a week. my putter. Eight days a After week. After day yeah. one of the twin fan, I concur that I suck at chipping as well. <laughs> and hitting, <laughs> dri and hitting and driving and putting. Oh, Everything other than drinking was shit. <laughs> I love it. Well, should we get to the E9? Yeah, let's do that. All right. You know all about this, Beamer. I Emergency do. nine. Here we go. We ask this to everyone. You can trade lives with anyone for a day, dead or alive. Who are you going to be? Oh, man. You know, I, I almost thought about this, and then I stopped thinking about it um, <laughs> because I was, I was trying to come up with something really witty. Trading live with somebody dead or alive. Just a day. Okay. I'm going to go um, I'm gonna go with the boss, Frank Sinatra. Oh, mm, nice. music, that's musician side. Yeah, I, that's a hell of a pick, by the way. Listen, that dude. Listen, didn't do if, too many things. Shit. If if you're gonna live one day of your life, I want to be Frank Sinatra, 
in Las Vegas for one day. Can I come? Tough to beat that. <laughs> Had you pegged, you, I feel like you'd be a yes. good Jimmy Buffett for a day. I could be. Like a little, just got no sure. cares in the world, tropical vibe, listen, listen. anything goes. Yeah, but that, I mean, that happens like, most every day but yeah be, you kind of already live that frank's Sinatra, frank's different i mean seriously that is i mean that is bringing it yeah that's frank a tough is, one that's a yeah. good answer by the way well, thank okay you. I appreciate it uh next one who do you think pulled off the highlights in the hair more successfully you have to be kidding me <laughs> you or ian poulter um you it, was know, a, it was a hot look okay okay so a leopard head well, of course. I mean, Spotted Owl. Yeah. I think is. I think Spotted Owl was what I was called by um, by Faraday. You know what? You know it. You should have the visor so people could see it. You know what? I did because you know why? I won. I won with the Spotted Owl. I saw look. you after the international. You took your hat off. You're like rubbing your oh, head. All absolutely. the stress when Lowry's going crazy. Absolutely. So you know what? I pull it off. Who you did know? that for you? Was that professionally done, or you do that? Do you think I'm capable? I don't know. Dude. <laughs> with the, the, listen, question listen, the caliber of the listen, highlight, I thought listen, you might. I don't know. You and I have really known each other for about the last two and a half hours. It's you been really good, think that I could have pulled that off? Yeah, Not a chance. You're a no. talented man. Oh, God, no. Listen, you're giving way too much credit. No, no. This no. is so funny because we don't go over our questions very often before we do this. Ever. Obviously, today we were playing golf. One of my E9s was who, who pulled off the blonde highlights better in the early 2000s, you, Tiger, or JT? Yeah. Oh, oh me! I uh, listen, dude. I, Tiger with the blonde highlights was not a good. Oh look. my God! I'm not God. quite sure what he was thinking with that one. He's yeah. had some questionable fashion. Dude, he just needs to be bald. He needs to shave his shape. Listen, he's, he's bald. Is it. beautiful guy. He's bald is beautiful. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. It, LeBron Tiger can't give it up. Tiger can't quite bend the knee. Listen, I'm it's about. Coming. Listen, I'm about to shave my head. Like probably next year. By this time, we're really? doing this next year. I might shave my head. All right. Well, Maybe we'll, bring the highlights we'll, back before we'll, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just one I want you to. I want you to have highlights. I'll do it. I know you will. We'll make a bet where you have to do it some, for some reason. I'd do it. All right, next question. <laughs> I've made worse yeah. decisions. <laughs> yes, you have. You don't say. <laughs> After you Poor made line. your winning putt on the yep. 72nd hole of the PGA, you did a legendary little dance move. Yes. Did Dancing with the Stars ever call Rich B? No! <laughs> Those selfish Folks, that's no way. Unbelievable. You'd have been my no, first call. No, they didn't. You know what? And thankfully they didn't because I would have taken that up. <laughs> yeah, I know you would have. <laughs> I would have gone. I would have gone all in too. And you know what? You're built for it, dude. I would have. Listen, the one major regret that I have after winning the PGA is that I get I got invited to the David Letterman show. Mm -hmm. On to. David Letterman show, right? You said no. Love Letterman. Okay. I was in Seattle. This was in New York. Yeah. Guess what? I said no. Yeah, that's David Letterman. That's Letterman, bro. Yeah. That's the king. I'm telling you, this is that is the thing that haunts me the most Call him back. in life. I can see David he's doing. Yeah. He's got well, the Rich Netflix Steve, show now. Okay, but I did. My but next he did. Guest is, but he did have he no the Rich Beam top ten list. Oh, good. Yeah, but I wasn't there to see. You could have done the top. Oh Dude, my. Letterman is. Letterman. You fly. You're and in Dubai, I, and he calls you tomorrow. I and say, I'm coming. Said no. Biggest regret for Rich Beam's career. No, David Letterman. That would be loser. It. Yeah, that's awesome. That would be loser. It. I love that. I'm guessing you. This had might that be the E4 today because yeah. <laughs> we got all overlappers, but uh, I'll audible here in a minute. Um, Our minds kind of think. Do like you scary. still have gotcha. the legendary? Is it the STX, the putter? Oh, yeah. The Where no. is that bad boy? That thing was filthy. Uh, it is – it's in the house somewhere. Is it a house? No, it's in our uh, – uh, it's in my uh, uh, locker. It's not somewhere. being used this week. What does it got to do to get back in the rotation? Oh, it's never get back in the rotation, no. I've got too many shakes going on, man. What do you got now? Uh, um, I've got – Odyssey. Yeah, I got to listen. You don't got the shakes with that? I have the twitches, yes. Oh, okay. I get yeah, that I, a little. I got the twitches, but yeah, no, the a STX. Bit too, actually. Yeah, that. Um, so, you guys know the story about Jesper Parnovic. Yeah, right? he's the one who brought up that little, yeah. little nub STX. Oh, yeah, yeah. That it's thing was sweet. It was like a little ping pong paddle. Yeah, ping pong, yeah. yeah and he, and he's just soft as shit. Ran into me on the driving range at, um, uh, at uh, Doral. He goes, What'd you put this in the bag? I go, This week? He goes, Oh. You're going to putt like a genius this week. And he goes, next week, though, you're going to putt like crap. Finish fourth in Doral. Next week, hit 31 out of 36 greens, miscut. Yep. <laughs> nice That's putt, it. Rich. That's it. 
<laughs> that's a yes for plan. One that week, is, you listen, use it all up. That's good. Uh, you know what? There's some there's some truth to that. There's just you know. So I still have that putter though. It's at it's actually um, it's back in Austin in my in my locker someplace. It's, Don't let it go. I was looking for uh, one no, for forever. Good. I was like, this guy makes everything. You know, I, I threw need one. one. I, I threw one in the, in the water here. Oh, on this lake right here? <laughs> oh, you didn't know about that? There's is about that, nine thousand tour players. There's a lot of shit in this lake too. right here too. You didn't know about so 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 at the fries dot com open one year, I got so mad after missing the cut. I mean, I threw my putter right in the middle of the lake. Dell sent in a diver to pick it up, and at this event uh, years ago, he actually presented it back to me, and we put it into a wooden coffin and gave it a Viking funeral, funeral and set it on fire and put it on the middle Beautiful. of the lake. That's an Beautiful. appropriate way to send it off. <laughs> Viking fantastic. funeral. There's a lot. This lake could tell stories. Oh, jeez. It yeah. could write another book. Exactly. All right, we mentioned your legendary caddy, Steve Duplantis, yes. earlier. Give me your favorite story you can share with Steve Duplantis on here on mm. Golf Subpar. So after we won in 1999 at the Kemper Open, um, we went out for multiple nights. Um, I think it was the Friday. It was Saturday night. No, sorry, sorry. It was Monday night after we won. Yeah, I'm tra- yeah. Same thing. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, Saturday, Monday, whatever. It was Monday night <laughs> after we won, and we were doing a tour of the town and just living, living it up, right? And he had run into this girl and and made plans with her for the second night in a row. And we're out at this bar, and Stevie was just absolutely lambasted. And he was mid-sentence talking to her. And, and all of a sudden, I see him turn sideways. Puke? Yep. Okay. No shame in that. Yeah. There's no problem. Turn with that. back around and pick up the conversation right where it left off. <laughs> That's I mean, a veteran. it was just a. It was there was absolutely hello. How you doing? <laughs> Everything going well tonight? I mean, it was just <laughs> flawless. Uh, and and I'm kind of thinking to myself, this guy's a professional. Yeah. The the stories about this guy. Oh, I don't know if you've heard. Like God I mean, showing him. up to the range. I think at Byron Nelson, he's caddying for Furyk with a poncho. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, there was, yeah. Yeah. Listen, I heard about I mean, that. Uh, yeah. I mean, he showed up. Like when he was carrying for me first week out, I mean on Sunday at Kemper Open, I had to carry my bag to the ranch. Well, that's one thing Furyk always said. He goes, "How do you go from Furyk, Furyk to you?" I got that's got to be the that. furthest end of the yeah. spectrum, I would think. No, but everybody said Furyk would say, "Why?" Yeah, I mean, he's a you guys champion. are pretty similar. They have the same amount of majors, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah, but they're everybody about said their business Furyk the same would say, way. Like, Furyk would carry his own bag to the range all the time. They're oh, like, yeah. Jim, why don't you fire this guy? He's like, he's too good of a caddy. That's exactly. As long as he shows up fourteen times, that. that's exactly. Yeah. He probably right. went from working eight hundred hours a week to he 20. was. Once you get him sighted yep. inside ropes, yeah, I mean, it was just like. <laughs> so I, I Monday qualified for the Nelson when I was in college. Okay. Got paired with Daniel Chopra on Saturday, and Steve Duplantis was caddying for That's him. exactly I met right. him when I was in college. That's exactly right. And he right. couldn't have been a nicer human. Yep. That's God, exactly. he was awesome. Yeah, and he just, once he got inside the ropes, I mean, it was just, yeah. he is in his zone. But once he left the ropes, I mean, <laughs> Look he out. was. Leaves work behind. Oh. Respect. I mean. Legend. I mean. Gone yeah. way too soon. I've heard the stories. Yes. He will live on for a long, long yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Long, long time. Yeah, All right, I got an audible here a little bit because the dancing, <laughs> the, dan- the the shimmy question has gone. I'll say this. All right, 25-year-old Rich Beam, you got one night to go out and get after it. Better night in Las Vegas or Juarez? Ooh. It's the only time Vegas might be safer. <laughs> Are we talking back when I was 25 and Juarez was safe? And you're making, yeah, you had 300 bucks a week or whatever it was oh, you were saying. Oh, dude, dude, I'm. How many nights were you over with in Juarez? 300, like in a month. $300 in Juarez could last me <laughs> a good week. <laughs> a you could week. be mayor. Dude, I could make that $300 in Juarez travel. How easy was it just to pop over and pop back? Like no problems back then? Yeah, no, no. I mean, 25 cents to get to to get back because when you, you, would, you walk over free and you walk back and you had to have a quarter. Walk over. That's a little steep. Listen, thing. you had to have a quarter, and what you used to do, seriously, you put a quarter in your shoe. That way, because you knew that you wouldn't lose your shoes. Hopefully, it's beautiful. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so you put a quarter in the bottom of your shoe, and you would walk back. I mean, that's oh yeah, I'm back. Do. Here you go, bud. It's you right would put here. a quarter. You would put a quarter oh, underneath your shoe. So when you walk back over, you're like, like, 
Oh, there, that's, oh that's yeah, why, I got to get back to the state. That's <laughs> why I have the quarter there, man. Oh, yeah. I knew <laughs> I that mean, beautiful. That I is could, a great story. That I, is beautiful. Listen, you could, I, you, I could make $300 in Vegas, or sorry, in Juarez last for f- forever. It'd be very happy. We should go to Fred's Rainbow Bar. Fred's Rainbow Bar, you could buy Coronas for a quarter. God. Or you get back across the border. You got to make no, sure. You have it in the shoe. Wow. You know what I'm saying, but if you need it, if you're on that yeah. last final final. But if you have three hundred dollars worth of quarters, it's a lot of Coronas. That's a lot. You need lot to bring a backpack, Coronas, baby. <laughs> no. All right, last question: <laughs> Who put the Wanamaker Trophy through more hell, you or John Daly? I don't know what John did with his, <laughs> but I know that what I did with mine was I. Do you remember last year when when uh, Colin picked up the trophy? Yeah. yeah. And the top the fell? Yep. Yeah. Well, I did that on the concrete. <laughs> I had Beautiful. to take it. I had to take it to my jeweler, and he had to bang it out. And it took two days, two full days, to bang out. And I'm sitting. I am sweating bullets. And this is the real one this isn't yeah. the, this isn't the fake one this is like it was sent from from west palm and bill eschenbrenner our pal yeah he he vouched for it for some ungodly reason like this is gonna make it back intact and i'm like i pull this thing out of my car and and the top just goes plunk. i'm like oh, mm. hey. hmm. mm. that's not good and so, so this thing bangs it out and he puts it back into place. He goes, you know, I have a metallurgist um, there. He goes, it's probably not the first time that thing's ever been dropped on no, there. Definitely so, not. Yeah. You know, but but I mean, um, I will say, I will say the real one, or even the fake one that I have, um, when you fill it up, it's if you fill it up with ice, uh, it's two full bottles of Jack Daniels and a two liter bottle of Diet Coke and a dozen <laughs> limes. And it's a, a taste, limes. roughly. And it's a taste. No, roughly. no, no. Yeah. No, no. A yeah. dozen limes, and it's a very tasty cocktail. Just put a straw and sit there. Oh no, no you have to lift it up. And drink okay, it. lift it up. It's you heavy. Yeah, it's gonna be heavy as shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? That's a workout. You want a straw? No. <laughs> no, I don't want a straw. I so no, sat there on your couch and just drank exactly out of it, watching right. TV. That's exactly. Take it down no. to Juarez. <laughs> yeah, don't Let take it to Juarez. It is. I don't have a quarter, but I got this trophy. I got this. Let's get me back. Here, take the top of this. Let's That's exactly right. Keep That's it. exactly awesome. Put it on right. my tab. Well, Beamer, as always, uh, you know, I've been a huge fan for a long, long time. And yeah. thank you so much for, for coming on with us and, yes, and your loyal support because I know you listen every week. Listen, I listen to all your guys' stuff, man. You guys are the best of the best. I can't thank you enough for having me, really. I, tr- truthfully, this means a lot to me having you on here. Thank we you, appreciate Beamer. appreciate you coming on. We can use some more like you. Appreciate you, brother. You got it, guys. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. That was Rich Beam joining us on Golf Subpart. What a legend. First off, my favorite story. Uh, how about the trip going over to Juarez from El Paso and putting the quarter in the shoe? Quarter in the shoe. That way you, know you can get back. <laughs> that is fantastic. That's got to make you feel good. Like, oh, dude, I'm going to just pop down there for a little bit. Don't worry. I've got a quarter in my shoe. Everything will be fine. wonder if it still costs a quarter to get back across. I don't know. That's a hell of a deal. Uh, pff, it might not be enough, though. <laughs> uh, they've got more shit to worry about than whether you got enough money to get back, I think. That's true, but... A guy who wins a major championship, specifically the PGA. I mean, can you imagine if the PGA could talk the stories he could tell between spending a year with Rich Beam, a year with John Daly? Yeah, that's a wild ride. That's a wild. Those boys are well seasoned. That was kind of, I guess, late glory days. I guess where there were still guys out there that like to get after it and have a good time. Rich Beam, definitely one of those. And you got a little taste of it, man. We talked about it with the book. Was it Bud Sweat and Tees? Or they followed him, you know, one of the riders. We're not going to talk about that rider. A rider followed him around for a while, kind of documented his life, how he liked to get after it. I mean, dude, that's a – name me a guy right now on PGA Tour that would sign up for that. And, it, and it's way more watered down. Like, they're not doing crazy stuff mm-hmm. like Rich Beam was doing. But who would want a guy out there like, I'm just no. going to ride an uncensored everything you do, following you around on the PGA Tour, and then I'm going to put it out in a book. Oh, and, and, you pay, don't get, and pay you nothing. And you get nothing for it. I mean – I don't know. I mean, just pick the guys that actually get out there and get after a little bit. Nobody would want that. Like, what's the upside? Nothing. I, no. I, I'm a interested bold to strategy, see, Cotton. Yeah. I'm interested to see what he does out on the PGA Tour Champions. Because I think, you know, he's a guy out there. He'll be above average length. 
off the tee. Um, it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, how serious he is about having a career out there. I think he can make a lot of noise. If he wants to, I think it ultimately comes down if he wants to. You got some guys that turn 50 and are dying to get out there, been in kind of no man's land from 44 or whatever it is to 50, can't compete on the PGA Tour, waiting for Champions Tour. Some guys get out there and can't wait to tee it up every single week. And some guys, I mean, he's got another career. He's not looking for anything to do. He's got TV going on. I, I, it'll depend on how interested he is in, in playing out there and competing yeah. and practicing and doing all that stuff. And Tommy Fleetwood, if you're listening, I'm not a lawyer, but I can put you in touch with a good one if you need to get a restraining order on Rich Beam. He's got a slight, it's not a slight, it's a ridiculous man crush on Tommy Fleetwood. Yeah, the facial expression and the sound effects that went along when we brought up Tommy. Bell, like, hey there. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying you're, you're a Tommy guy, huh? Yeah. Okay, all yeah. right, fair enough. It's like, that's. I mean, everyone's got a guy. We like the rat here, you know, on yeah. subpar. When he showed up, I was like, there he is, dude. That's the freaking rat. He's a dude. I love it. Well, Slays, we had a lot of fun with Rich Beam. Our gambling didn't go quite as well this week with our boys over at FanDuel, the greatest sports book in all the land. I had Sung JM. He finished tied for 11th. Not bad, but we're, we're here to win. Yeah, we want trophies. We're Matthew Wolf, Tony Finau, your boys struggle a little bit. I got 11th out of Sung JM, a t- tied for 25th out of Adam Hadwin. But you know what? We're just going to throw that one away. Goldfish. We're, we're goldfish here, dude. To the on Farmers to the Insurance Open, Tory Pines. The golf season is back in full swing, and there's no better way to make every moment more than on FanDuel Sportsbook. Each week, we love looking through all the different markets and finding fun and unique bets, like finishing position, matchup, matchups, round leaders, and group winners. And don't worry if you missed out on getting your bets in before the tournament starts, because FanDuel has live betting options all throughout the weekend, so you can always make every moment more. And if you win... They even get your winning winnings to you safely, and it's two hours. All right, Sleaze, tell me your, some of your favorite things about FanDuel. Well, same, it goes without saying, same game parlay. Let me tell you how I did this weekend. Uh, not good. The boy <laughs> took a little bit of a hit this weekend on the football arena. I'm ready to get it back in the golf, but you got player props, futures, whatever bet you're looking for, FanDuel's got it. You got live betting, which clearly we love. We like to get in there, you catch the game, show up for, in the first quarter, boom, you can still get in on the action. And the odds boosting specials that they offer every time, boom, they'll pick one every week. You get a huge boost on a, on a play you like. Those things are hitting at a crazy rate if you're getting in on those. So, yeah, those are just a few of the things. But I got some ground to make up this week in golf. Yeah, I, I thought this last tournament over the American Express over in Palm Springs was cool because heading into the final round, you had two rookies atop the leaderboard. So you didn't, you know, they're kind of unproven. Then you had some veterans behind him. And if you, you could go in there before the fourth round started and get Hudson Swafford at plus 1,700, nice little payout. Nice little pickup, yes. I mean, the dude was making some tweets. One par on the back nine for mm-hmm. HUD. And right now, FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game or golfer, and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back if you don't win your first bet. Seriously, there's no strings attached. Just place any bet you want. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you'll get your entire bet up to $1,000 back in site credit. Like I said, we are on to the Farmers Insurance Open. Torrey Pines, we got three days on the south course, one day on the north course. They're both beasts now since they went in and redid the north course. But we've got a great field. I believe six of the top ten in the world are there. The weather looks fantastic. I'm going to be out there covering it for CBS, so I hope that's the case. But um, this one's a lot of fun. This is when I feel like the golf season really starts. We get the big boys coming out. Big boys come out. This used to be when Tiger would show up for the first time. The fans were crazy. It's still one of the biggest ones of the West Coast swing. Big yard, hard golf course. And now, like you said, since they redid the North, that's that used to be the one where you had to go make your birdies. Now, it's like that's really hard, too. So, you got like you said, you got a lot of the guys in the top ten. And uh, it's go time. I, got, I feel good about my picks this week. After really? Last, I feel, I feel you pick a John Rom? more confident in this. I got John Rom for everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's get to it. We're going to give you some golf picks as well as NFC and AFC championships as well. All right. I'm going to go with a guy starting off here. He's won here before. He loves the place. He always seems to be a factor. He's going off at 37 to 1, which I kind of like that. Steep. Yeah, steep. Mark Leishman. Okay. Love Leash. Like that. Yep. Yeah, all right. I mean, you got to hit fairways, you got to hit green. It's really hard to play from the rough out here, and if you're not hitting greens, just pack it. I mean, it, you got to strike your golf. I'll player. give you a dark horse Plus your as well. Snedeker and you make everything. Yes. Well, wow, that's funny. You just said that name right there. Because going off is my dark horse at 100-1, to a guy who's starting to trend and play better golf. He's been in a little bit of a funk, but he, I believe he finished top 35 down in Hawaii, finished tied for 14th at the American Express. Other than Tiger, I don't know if anybody has a better track record around Torrey Pines than my man, Brant Snedeker. He's got two wins around the place. A second, uh, never misses the cut. 100 to 1, 
I like sprinkling a little something on Brant Snedeker. And he does it a little different. Like, you think of this place as a big yard, long, you know, length plays a big role. Got to hit the fairways, rough's tough. Got to hit a lot of greens. You think of ball strikers first, and Brant really doesn't check that box. But that putter, for some reason, I mean, they get on these poet greens and, dude, light, I mean, lights it up everywhere but with the putter. With the weather forecast, and obviously meteorologists have been wrong before, but right now it's highs in the upper 60s, sunny, very little wind, and no rain. So it should dry out. Play, hopefully play a little shorter. I like that for Brant Snedeker. Okay, those are your two. I don't disagree with either of those. I'm going to go off the top, my guy at the top of the odds sheet. I feel good about this one, Cole. I'm going Will Zalatoris, 29-1. Mm. You think about ball striking, iron play, I mean, he's a name that's in that conversation, right? He just came back from, from his first event at the American Express since the 2022 year started. T6 out there in the desert, played well. Uh, seventh last year at this event, and I just think of— Missed I mean, the cut at the U.S. Open because I picked him. Yeah, I did miss that the cut was, there. One of his stuff. few, like, not top yeah. 25s at the time. But, I mean, to just think of this kid, T to green, man. I mean, the putter, maybe that's the place you look at, but I feel like it matters less on this place. It's more about hitting it in the fairway, hitting it on the green, unless you're Brant Snedeker, and he does it as good as anyone. So I'm going with Will Zalatoris, 29-1. to 1. I like that pick. Dark horse side, if you're going a little further down. 46-1, to 1, another dude. His name comes up a lot when I'm talking about guys. Corey Connors. Coming off a missed cut, a rare missed cut. Coming off week. a rare missed cut, yeah, which is strange. I think. More of a putting contest, I would say, out there in Palm Springs than, than Torrey Pines is going to be. But T, I mean, I mean, he's so good, and the putter just needs to be okay. And the Torrey's a place where you can kind of get away with it being okay. I'm going with Corey Connors at 46 to 1. All right. For my well, darkie. That's, that's our picks for this week's Farmers Insurance Open. Let's do a little football here, what we really know. Yes. Our expertise. After my great weekend, yeah. dude, let me pile on some more knowledge. All right, we got two incredible games. We got the. L.A. Rams against the San Francisco 49ers. The Rams are going off at minus three favorites, playing at home. Could possibly be the first team ever to host an NFC Championship game and host a Super Bowl, which would be really big for them. Then we got the Kansas City Chiefs and the Cincinnati Bengals led by Joe Burrow. Kansas City going off minus seven-point favorites at Arrowhead. All right, here's my deal. I think the Rams made a lot of moves this this offseason and during the season as well because they are ready to win now. Yeah, they're okay. trying. They're all their chips yeah. on the table. They almost puked it all off against Tampa and the Tom Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Bucks last week. Minus three. They've had a terrible record against San Francisco. I think now's the time they turn it around. Matthew Stafford, Vaughn Miller, Odell Beckham Jr. I like them minus three to cover. Hate to agree with you, and with the way the dogs performed this past week, it's hard to go with faves, but I'm going to go with the Rams as well. Just all the pieces in place. It's the year of the dogs, like we said. Mm. Matthew Stafford at the helm. He's been waiting a long time to get a shot to win some playoff games and get to a Super Bowl. But is it the year of the dogs at or home? underdogs? It's mm. both. It's, Tough. It's, a, yeah, it's been the year of the dogs. So if you too. pick L.A. or San Francisco, you'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with the Rams as well in that game. And then on the other side, Chiefs, Bengals, at Arrowhead, minus seven feels like a lot. It sucks because I feel like – the two best teams in the playoffs just played each other in mm -hmm. Kansas City and Buffalo. I mean, damn, what a game. What a terrible ending to have Josh Allen not be able to take the field after that. But I think the Chiefs are firing. I, they're my lean for the Super Bowl, but I just think the Chiefs get it done at Arrowhead. I think they dodged the biggest bullet they got in Buffalo. So, Minus seven. So you're going Kansas City? Yeah. It was, I hate taking two favorites, dude. I tell you what, since, since my Cowboys are out, I've jumped on this Joe, Joe Burrow and Cincinnati Bengal bandwagon. I, I love watching them play. Jamar Chase is an absolute monster. The offensive line for the Cincinnati Bengals really worries me. They gave up nine sacks last week and still beat Tennessee somehow. Joe Burrow's unreal. I think seven points is a lot. It is a lot. And I think Kansas City spent a lot of energy against Buffalo last week. I think Kansas City wins, but I think Cincinnati keeps it close. Just Joe Burrow and that Cincinnati defense is really, really good. Just got to give him a little bit of time. And I think they can hang in there. I'm going to go with the Bengals plus seven. So you're taking Bengals. You're taking Chiefs to win, not yes. cover. Okay. I think the Super Bowl will be Rams-Chiefs. I got two favorites. So my, I, mean, I want to go with underdogs, but I've been wrong on everything this past weekend. There's a lot of over-unders and same-game parlays, things like that. But just got to go with my gut here and go in two faves. So, all right, we're aligned on one, and we're on the other side on the other. All right. Well, if you've never, tried, yeah, if you've never tried FanDuel Sportsbook, what are you waiting for? Go to FanDuel.com slash subpar or download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started. Be sure to sign up with promo code subpar so they know that we sent you. Must be 21 years and older and present in Arizona, Connecticut, New Jersey, or New York. 
first online real money wager only refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org backslash chat in Connecticut or 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey or 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. All right. So a lot of help now, if you got a yeah, gambling problem, dude. There's a lot gracious. of available resources to help you with your gambling problem. You can call me. I'll talk to you I don't about need it. help, dude. I just keep firing. <laughs> or just do that. Just don't. You don't have a problem. Just it's going to turn around. All right. Well, what a week in sports it was. We got another great week coming. This was a fantastic episode. And coming up next week, when he's not in the gym, he's listening to Golf Subpar. We got Scott Stallings live and in studio. You're not going to want to miss it. Everyone have a great week. We'll talk to you on next week's Golf Subpar.